tonight on Denver 7 News at 8. Another round of storms hitting the metro. Flash flood watches are in effect. Flash flooding a possibility here across much of Colorado. I'll let you know how much you can expect in your neighborhood. And a lesson learned from past floods, serving as a reminder of those who lost everything. Just seeing the devastation was uh, something that I never hoped to experience again. How one Colorado city is using the lessons learned from a tragedy. If something dramatic happens, they're prepared. Thank you for watching Denver 7 News on Local 3. I'm Jessica Porter. I'm Danny New. We begin with breaking news out of Loveland after police responded to a domestic incident involving children. We're told officers also deployed flashbangs. Denver 7's Rob Harris joins us live with the latest. Rob. Yeah, and guys, it's been about six hours almost since this incident first started here in Loveland. But as you can see behind me, we still have police and investigators on scene. And we are told they'll probably be here for quite some time. Now, police aren't telling us too much officially yet in terms of what happened, other than they do tell us that the incident has been resolved. But I have been talking to a lot of neighbors here in the area who basically got to hear and watch this happen in real time. Like I said, they're saying it happened just after two o'clock. They heard two loud bangs and a lot of neighbors that I spoke with said they didn't really actually at first think they were gunshots. They thought that they were trash cans that had fallen or something to that effect because of how loud they were and how they came out of basically the blue. They then heard screaming from women and children, and that obviously raised the alarm there. They saw a flood of police and ambulances coming into their neighborhood, told dozens and dozens of officers were on scene with their guns drawn, sending a drone up into the air as well. After about 45 minutes on scene, that's when that flashbang was used according to neighbors, and then they saw them escort children out of the house. I wanna share with you the way that one neighbor I spoke with described all this unfolding before her house. We get out here and look and we, there's just people, guns drawn. I mean, the, the SWAT team was here and just kids screaming in the streets and it was just like, what is happening here? And you could just see something in the yard. There was a white sheet over it. So I just all of a sudden it went into a panic and it just didn't look good. That's basically the sentiment from a lot of the neighbors I've spoken to today that they're really worried and just confused and they want answers from police. Again, we don't have too many official responses from Loveland police yet, other than they did tweet about two hours ago that the incident is quote resolved and there's no ongoing threat to the community. Danny. Thank you, Rob, for checking in on that. We appreciate it. And everyone, this is, of course, a developing situation. We will keep you updated on air and online over on the DenverChannel.com. Been a busy day for storms and flood warnings across the Front Range tonight. You're taking a live look over Denver where the skies are cloudy, but it looks like the rain has subsided for at least for now. Yes, let's see how things are looking in Denver and beyond. Meteorologist Stacey Donaldson, how are conditions looking for tonight now? Well, thank goodness here for the Front Range. We really haven't seen a lot in the way of rainfall when we've been soaked the last couple of nights. Now we still have flood watches in effect for Southern Colorado, where we still have heavy rain falling and into our northern and central mountains flash flood watches as well. The National Weather Service did just lift the flash flood watch here to the west of Denver because we really haven't seen much rain moving through. Most of the storms have stayed up in the higher elevations and as they've started to come this direction, they've really just fallen apart as they come closer to the metro area. So flash flood watch still in effect here just west of Boulder all the way up toward Red Feather Lakes and Estes Park. And that's until 10 o'clock tonight as that rain continues to come down through these areas. And of course, to the south, some heavy rain, especially toward Alamosa. But most of this moving out toward Pueblo and Colorado Springs as we go through the next hour or so. So flooding also a possibility there. The closest metro rain that we've seen is down here toward Palmer Lake lake and south of Castle Rock as these storms have pushed up against the foothills and moved into the I-25 corridor. As for the rest of the night, we're expecting cloudy skies, temperatures going from the 70s down into the 60s, and that's where our overnight lows will be tonight. They'll be in the upper 50s, low 60s with cloudy skies, but we have chances for flooding again tomorrow with heavy rainfall moving through the state, and we'll talk more about how that may affect you coming up. Thank you, Stacey. And of course, burn scars near Boulder remain under a flash flood watch tonight. The city received between two and three inches of rain last night, increasing the risk for flooding. Boulder is the number one flood risk as far as cities in Colorado go because of how close it is to the mountains. Plus, it's an older city developed in the late 1800s, which was before modern floodplain regulation, meaning the city is playing a game of catch up when it comes to implementing flood projects. 
We spoke with Mark Painter, who was walking his dog along the creek path tonight and who's lived here since the late 70s. He has lived through both flooding and fires in the area, including the flood in 2013, which he called horrific. That flood has created a bit of fear in Boulder residents any time that they see rain moving in, especially when burn scars in the area create lots of potential for damage. And the city has completed a number of flood projects since 2013. There are a lot of uh, drop structures on the creek, which is where there's large rocks placed all across so that the water kind of falls in a step fashion to control the, the um, velocity of the flow and erosion potential. That, the 2013 flood was so extreme that it, it moved those big rocks that were the size of cars. Right now, those with bold utilities are completing their flood master plan, which covers the next several decades and lays out how they're going to fund and prioritize those projects. Now, also, you should know that if you live in Boulder, you can go to boulderfloodinfo.net to learn more about how to prepare for flash floods. And did you take a look at this yet? It's hail piles and piles of hail in the middle of Estes Park. A stretch of Elkhorn Avenue looks like a winter wonderland from late last night until the hail melted away after the sun came out today. And you can also look at this in Fort Collins. These are uh, photos of hail zones that are well, just look at them. They're each more than two inches across. Three of them fit in that guy's hand. I mean, those look like snowballs that somebody already made and then dropped them from the sky. <laughs> Tennis ball size. Yeah. Well, you can always get the latest weather forecasts right on your streaming device. Just download the Denver 7 app. You can also get the weather for your neighborhood 24-7 on the DenverChannel.com. Well, we are getting some more details on a deadly police shooting in Inglewood Sunday night. In a recorded video statement, Inglewood Police Chief Sam Watson uh, now says officers were aware that two people were in the home near Bellevue and Federal before shots were fired. Chief Watson also says that shots were fired at officers from the east and north side windows of the home. Officers shot back. Minutes later, one suspect surrendered at the front door, and when police went inside, they found 22-year-old Matthew Mitchell, who was shot near the east window. Mitchell died of his injuries. Police say body cam footage will be released at some point, but for now, they are still investigating. Five Colorado primary candidates that submitted recount requests had a 5 p.m. deadline to pay the recount costs. One of them, Tina Peters. Her office says that they raised $230,000 necessary for the recount. However, the Secretary of State's office raised that price to $255,000. And that's because some of the work will need to happen over the weekend to meet the timeline required by state law. We're still waiting to hear if the five candidates met the 5 p.m. deadline. Well, the U.S. now leads the world in confirmed monkeypox cases with more than 4,600. The FDA has approved a vaccine manufacturing facility and expects about 800,000 doses to arrive by tomorrow. And that's on top of more than 310,000 doses that were already delivered in anticipation of that approval. These scams are becoming more and more prevalent. Scammers trying a new scheme to steal your information and preying on people searching for a job. This sounds like it was pretty bold. They actually conducted the interview via Skype? Via Skype, yeah. They actually went through an entire interview process. One coach proving he's a man of his word. And I said, you know what? If any of you qualify, I will personally pay for you to get there. Now our Denver 7 viewers are helping his team reach one of the biggest stages in Ooh. high school wrestling for years to come. <laughs> Yes, I guess. <laughs> this is all